Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. Unconventional warfare. So rolling into the war in Afghanistan. Um, the last time I talked about the Q course and all that, let me just back up a little bit because I got a lot of questions about Special Forces Selection and Assessment, SFAS. I was asked to go into more detail on it. Now, it was 20 years ago, so I don't remember that much. However, um, three big course, came back to Bragg from Germany to attend the course and a guy I knew had gone through about six months ahead, so I had a little bit of intel on it. Um, they have this famous thing in, in, in selection where they say, don't be late, don't be last, and don't be light, meaning don't be late to the formation, don't be last on the event, and don't be light if you're supposed to have a 45-pound rucksack. Put 50 pounds in there because they'll stop you periodically throughout the events and they'll weigh your ruck to make sure you're not light. And if you're light, you're done. Um, we we went out to obviously Camp McCall. We stayed in these big billets, and um, it was not as hard as people make it out to be. Right now, people have heard me say this before. If I embellish my accomplishment, like oh my god, it was so hard, hell week, this whatever, then it makes me more of a badass. Whereas if you just apply yourself and you're in decent shape when you get there, special operations selection is not trying to fail everybody. They can't. The regiment would cease to exist. They're looking for people. They need people in the regiment. So they're not trying to get rid of everybody. They're trying to weed out people who quit and people who are there for the wrong reasons. And that's what it's designed to do. You can kind of deal with all kinds of personalities in special operations, you can't have a quitter. You just can't because they're a liability and they'll quit at the wrong time. So if you bear that in mind, you get a decent shape, rocking and running. You're able to swim. Even the swim test, when I went there, you had to swim the length of the pool in BDUs and boots with a rifle on your back. Um, and then you had to like retrieve the rifle off the bottom of the pool or something like that. Um, when I went, it was a go or no go. If you couldn't swim, you, you didn't get selected. Now... As far as I know, you can take the swim test and fail it. You can still go through selection and pass and get selected. And during the Q course, they will give you free swim lessons to teach you how to swim. You have to be able to swim by the time you graduate, right? So even if you just did your swim lessons during language school, that's four to six months. Um, there's no reason why you shouldn't swim, be able to swim with a rifle on your back and uniform. It's pretty important for all military, for all people really, to be able to swim. So we go out there, um, they would start you on runs, and it's an undetermined distance, right? So they'll just say, hey, run this way until we tell you to stop. So it could be three miles, could be five miles, could be ten miles, you don't know. My philosophy was just stay in the middle of the pack. I just tried to stay in the middle of the pack, pace myself, and I figured if I'm in the middle, I'm okay. And that's what I did the whole time. Um... I remember doing the obstacle course out there at Camp McCall, Nasty Nick, they call it. And there's some big, huge obstacles in that thing. And they don't, they teach you how to negotiate each obstacle, and then they run you through it. And there's an instructor standing at each obstacle, and people would fall off this big 30, 40 foot tower and slam on the ground. And they'd be like, you know, out, not wind knocked out of them, laying there feeling sorry for themselves. And the cadre would come up and walk up to them and say, Candidate, you failed to negotiate this obstacle. Do you wish to try again? <laughs> and if you get up and did it again, you were good. And if you didn't, then you were gone, right? Um, so we went through tunnels with half filled with water to see if you're claustrophobic. Uh, a lot of rucking, a lot of running. Um, they, they have you sitting around the bay and they write stuff on the board, which I think is now a big screen TV, but they had a whiteboard. And periodically they just write stuff on there like, you know, five o'clock in the morning, 45 pound rock without water and food, uh, whatever. And then people would check it periodically. I never checked the board once because there was a hundred paranoid people in the bay with me that would check it every 30 seconds. So I figured somebody will check it. I did not find it that bad. Um, we did a trek at the end, which was, I think, four or five navigation points. We had to find over like a 40, I might be wrong on my, my numbers here, over a 48 hour period. And, um, you you could uh, you could go at your own pace, which was kind of cool, and you were on your own. And uh, I think somebody measured it at the end. And it was like sixty kilometers or something like that. But you, when you have a rucksack on your back, you just get used to it. You become strong, 
Um, good navigation will save you from going through the draws and the nasty stuff. And I will say the navigation at Camp McCall here in North Carolina is about 20 minutes out the road from where we are now is difficult because there's no, not very distinguishable terrain. It's all woods, it's all pine trees, and the contour interval is like 10 feet, and the draws are particularly nasty. Um, because that, that they grow all year round and they're super thick and you can't walk roads and you can't cross on bridges. So we do run land navigation classes here. Um, Kevin Estella just got here, so he's going to run some and I'll run some, but we do pull the army guys aside at the end. Land nav is land nav. It's not military land nav, but and I'll, I'll run them through some, some Camp McCall tests on a once to 50,000 map that the army used and, and, and kind of get them prepped and give them some advice. So... Um, at the end, when it was over, they separated us all and they said, okay, the following people go to that building and, and the rest, you know, stay where you are. And then people, they're calling out names and, and you're like, even though I knew I did fairly well or I thought I did fairly well, you just never know. And I have this uh, insecure part of me that was like, well, maybe I didn't make it, you know, and always self-doubt has been a huge problem of mine my whole life, but... Um, and then you see guys getting called out to go to that building, and you're like, man, he was strong. And then you're like, oh, he was weak. I know he, 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 you know, he, he probably failed, but you don't know. And then you look around at who's left standing, and you're like, okay, I know he's strong, and he's strong, and he's strong. Don't know that guy, whatever. And then they brought us all into a building and said, okay, you guys passed, and here's what we're going to do now. So at that point, we started filling out security clearances, which I was not prepared for. And you have to get a secret clearance right off the bat. Um, later on, I got a top secret clearance. Getting a top secret clearance with having been born in a foreign country, served in a foreign army, had a foreign wife. Um, not great. I had a foreign wife who overstayed her visa. I overstayed my visa. Uh, and having 14 brothers and sisters, not great, right? So I had to sit there and try to remember I remember names, obviously, of brothers and sisters, but dates of birth, no clue. Addresses, absolutely no clue. And I started digging and digging and digging, and I gave them as much as I could, but it was completely inefficient and and uh, incomplete. So did my security clearance, and then I had to go back to Germany for a couple of months and um, until I got a, a, a Q course date later in the year in, in, in 2000. So basically, if you're thinking of going, you can go to selection now. You can go to SF straight off the street, right? You go through basic training. You sign up as an 11 Bravo, which is an infantryman. You have to be, I think, 20. And th there are other parameters. You need a certain GT score, obviously. But you can go in, go basic training. AIT, Advanced Training, Airborne School, and then you come to Fort Bragg, and then you go through SOP C1, which is Special Operations Preparation Course, which I think is like five weeks long. So you're doing a five-week course that prepares you for a three-week selection course. And the, the, the graduation rate for 18 extras, which is this program right off the street, is very, very high. It's later on the Q course to get in trouble. Um, but you would go through that SOP C program, then you'd go to selection. Once you're done with selection, you would go to what's called basic leadership training and basic leadership course, which was called the warrior leader course when I was the first sergeant in charge of that course. And then when you do all that, you go through the Q course. Okay. I did not do that right. I was already in the infantry for six years. I was a staff sergeant, so I was very, very um, experienced. And I but I went when I was 35. And people think you're too old. I think you're in your prime in your 30s. Men and women, I think you're in your prime. I think physically, you know how to work out, you know how to eat properly, and you know how to not be stupid and get an injury. Um, so people will DM me or email me every now and again and be like, I'm 30 and I want to do this and I don't know if I'm too old. And I'm like, if you don't do it now, you're going to regret it when you're 50. So Better to just bite the bullet and do it. And the only obstacle, age is just a number. The only obstacle you're putting in, you're putting those obstacles yourself. And I'll say, you're not too old. You can do it. And they'll say, well, I have this going on or this. And I'll be like, you're making excuses now. Um, either just go or don't go. But make that decision and live with it. Don't be looking back. So I went when I was 35, very experienced, had no injuries, and uh, did not have a big problem. So when I say it's not as hard as people say, part of that is that I was very, very prepared. Um, 
but it, it's a it's a mental focus thing too. If you go with the idea that well, if I fail, I can do this, or if I fail, then you've already mentally failed. Um, you should go with the mindset that nothing, absolutely nothing, will make me quit. I will bust my ass and give 150% every day. And if they don't select me, then they don't select me. But it won't be because I didn't put the effort in. I had a, I had an officer in Germany who was West Point grad, Ranger Tab, um, infantry officer. And after I went, he was still there. And then, because they have to wait when they're officers, they have to wait a certain window after they're a captain, before they become a major, they have a little window there to go to SF. And he was a pretty squared away officer, but when I was working at Camp McCall as a small unit tactics instructor, I saw him in the chow hall, and you don't eat in the chow hall in, in selection unless you quit. Everybody eats outside, but if you quit, they put you in the chow hall. And I was like, what happened? And he was like, I was in Big Muddy Lake, chest deep water, middle of the night, and I just had enough and I quit. And I was like, oh my God. That is such a foreign concept to me because when you quit once, you'll quit again and again and again. It just becomes easier each time. So if you go there, do good PT, um, have a good mindset and just say, hey, they can kick me out if they want, but I will not quit. You'll be okay. They're not looking to kick everybody out. They're looking to find people because you're not getting selected as a Green Beret. You're getting selected as a candidate to move forward to the next year and a half of training. Okay, so you don't got to be perfect. You can make mistakes, um, but you don't draw attention to yourself. Don't be late, don't be last, and don't be light, and you'll be okay. All right, moving forward. Unconventional warfare. So basically, all warfare since World War II has been unconventional, pretty much. Hasn't been a big, I guess the Gulf War was maybe sort of a uh, conventional war, and maybe the initial invasion of Iraq, but it all kind of, evolves into this unconventional counterinsurgency type war. So Afghanistan, um, the invasion of Afghanistan happened very quickly after 9-11 because it was a terrorist training camp. Now we can look at this hindsight being 2020. Obviously huge mistakes were made in Afghanistan and 20 years later we pull out, we leave them billions of dollars worth of equipment and better off. Now we killed a lot of them but they're in it for the long war. They are willing to take those hits, and the American military and the American public are not. Um, some of these things are hindsight, looking back, but some of them I spotted early on in the war, and, and I'll elaborate on that a little later. So once we got out of Camp McCall on, the, on that detail we were on, we got our gear, and we headed to uh, Afghanistan, uh, flew into... Kandahar initially and got stuck in Kandahar. The team I was going to in third group were in Organi, which the, the the launch base for that is Bagram, which is up north. The um so I spent a couple of days in Kandahar sitting on my ass, getting crazy, uh trying to get a flight up to Bagram. End up getting a flight to um Uzbekistan and then taking a flight back down. I remember talking to some PJs in Uzbekistan, excuse me. So the pararescue guys in the Air Force are the ones who fly in in helicopters and, you know, provide medical. And they're phenomenally trained, but they sit on their ass most of the time. And that's just a fact. A lot of times they were bored to tears sitting in Uzbekistan waiting for the 911 call. Um, and I was like, man, all that training to do that. Crazy. So if you're going to go on a pipeline, just just take a good look at everything that pipeline does. It's funny because before 9-11, everybody had very, very specific uh, objectives in special operations, right? Ranger Regiment, strike force for the infantry, right? Delta Force, hostage rescue, um, SEALs, maritime, uh, SF, unconventional warfare. But once the war kicked off, there was, everybody wanted to play, number one. And there was so much to be done that everybody did everything. You had SEALs doing fade and foreign internal defense and unconventional warfare, and you had SF doing strikes and hits on high value targets, and you had, uh, there was so much cross pollination. Nobody, no unit in the US military evolved 
more during GWAT than the Ranger Regiment, in my opinion, right? Ranger Regiment started as a very, very, they started the GWAT as a very high and tight elite infantry unit, which, and they've evolved now in, into a, a top tier special operations strike force, okay? Very disciplined unit, very good at what they do. And, um, yeah, they've, they've really, really evolved. But everybody wanted to do everything and everybody wanted to get their hands in there. And that's fine. The problem is the big army wanted into Afghanistan too. And they, because that's how generals get promoted. That's how everybody wants to get in. And instead of learning from what the Russians did, we just flooded the place with conventional forces. And if ever there was an, a, a, a mission that should have been an unconventional war with small teams. I think Afghanistan was that. You can't put enough troops in there. You're just becoming a target. And armor and vehicles don't do well in that country. It was made for ambush, made to uh, restrict movement, and uh, made to rocket people from high ground. The so I get in. I get into Kandahar, and right away I notice that I, I'm in my billet one night and I'm just hanging out and I can hear music blasting. And of course, I, I you know, I'm growing my beard and I'm going out to war and I'm, I'm going to go fight, live in austere conditions, which I did on that trip. But I can hear music in Kandahar and I'm like, what the hell is that? And I walk towards the fence inside the little special operations base and I look across the, the road and there's an Air Force base, I think it was Air Force base, and there's a beach party going on and they have volleyball, lights, they're laughing and joking and are just having a grand old time. They're blasting music. And I'm like, wow. And it reminded me of uh, Apocalypse Now. You know, when the guy goes to uh, Saigon and he's at the, the big party and the, the, the Playboy bunny girls are there. And he says the more they make it look seem like home, the more they made people miss home. Right, and I remember sitting at the time going, "What are we doing here?" Like you think World War Two, they were basically told to go, and when you're done, you can come home. When you're done fighting the war, you can come home. And we're there, and we are pouring billions and billions of dollars and thousands and thousands and thousands of troops in, because for every guy on the ground fighting, there's probably ten support people. And what people don't know, like in in Iraq and Afghanistan. Only a fraction of the people who served there actually saw the enemy and engaged the enemy um, in combat. And only a fraction of the people left the big bases in Bagram and Kanahar and Baghdad and uh, Mosul. Most of the people never, if they did the same job, they do at Fort Bragg and Fort Benning, and they sit in their air conditioning offices and they, they do the same job they did at home and get the same combat pay. So it's a tiny fraction of people who actually go out and fight, which is, is kind of shocking. Um, so we're, we're, I'm stuck in Kandahar, and I eventually get a flight up through Uzbekistan and into Bargram. Land in Bargram, go get my weapons, get my gear, and I'm waiting on a flight out to Organi. Now, the team I was going to were already in Organi. They'd been ambushed like a week or two earlier because rockets came in on them, and they punched out to the rocket launch site which is a baited ambush and they got ambushed and the guy got shot in the arm nobody else got killed thank thankfully um so he got medevaced and we're back and we're waiting in bargram to move out and take over skin firebase which is in Patika province and it's close to the pakistani border it's like seven kilometers from the pakistani border which anybody who's ever fought counterinsurgency in any country in the world knows that um if that insurgent force has a base in a foreign country and they can jump in and out of the across the border, it becomes a safe haven that you can't you can't fire at them, you can't shoot artillery at them, and you damn sure can't pursue them. It's the same for the British in Northern Ireland, right? IRA would hit them, jump across the border into the south. It's the same in Laos. It's the same everywhere. So a very, very dangerous part of the country. Now, I will say Afghanistan in 2004 was not as bad as it became later on. Um, I think when I got there, the Taliban were somewhat still on their heels from the initial invasion and the Northern Alliance and were building up the, pack, the, the Afghan army. Um, but it hadn't been built yet. But the Taliban were coming back. They were starting to attack. They were starting to rocket and ambush. But it, it got much, much worse later on. So we get there. Um, we roll out. Once I get to Organi, I link up my team. 
And again, I, I repeated a trait that I've done many, many times in my life. I assumed everybody knew more than me because I'm the new guy. And that just was not the case, especially with this team. Um, everybody's beards, everybody's got mismatched clothes, uniforms, and nobody's got rank on, so I didn't know anybody's rank. Not that it matters. I was an E7, Sergeant First Class, when I got there, and most of the guys on the team were E6s, Staff Sergeants. Not that that matters, but that most of them, they didn't have much longer on the team than I did, and they damn sure didn't have as much experience as I did. So I get there, um, living in pretty austere conditions, uh, in this bay, this dirty bay, and, and we're waiting to move out. So it's all very, very living out of my backpack. And I had a backpack and a duffel bag, I think. Um, so went to the range, did a little shooting, make sure everything's zeroed and, 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 and tied. Uh, we took rockets there a couple of times while I was there waiting. And um, the rockets that they used, they prop them up. They didn't have launchers back there, very rare. Um, and they would prop artillery shells up on the, a mountain and point it in your general direction and fire it off with a timing device and launch it and, and pretty inaccurate. But that made them really dangerous because you don't know where to, to take cover, right? I take cover behind this wall, it's just as likely to hit me as I take cover over there, right? And they come screaming in and, and smaller bases didn't have any defense on them. Bargram had these phalanx guns that have Gatling guns and they launch rounds that didn't come. It's all computerized and everything. But out there you had no, no uh, no way to take that rocket down. You just had to let it land and um, maybe launch artillery at, the, at the, the point of origin or, or maneuver to it. But maneuvering to it is very dangerous because it's a bait, it can be a baited ambush. So we, we took rockets and uh, as we prepped and we got our stuff ready. Now, when we rolled from Organi out to... Uh, Shkin, I think it was that two or th three day drive, maybe two days, and we, we had a convoy. Our trucks back then had no armor. They had, uh, I think one of them had a chicken plate, which is the armor in front of the 50 cal, and one didn't, and then it had no doors, and it was light skinned. Because it's a balance. It's the ground mobility vehicles designed to be able to climb mountains and get off roads and stuff like that. The problem is you're super channelized in Afghanistan, and a lot of times there are no roads. You're driving in a riverbed, and um, the worst thing you want to do when you're being ambushed or IDs or attacked by an insurgent force is become predictable, but you have no choice. There's one way into some places and one way out, and that's what you deal with, unless you get a helicopter. So as we rolled out there, very aware that uh, super vulnerable. I was driving one of the Humvees on that trip and we stopped and we had these big jingle trucks which broke down periodically and we had to get them all, you know, rigged up and we had some indage with us. Now, the Afghan army was very, very new there. We did not work with the Afghan army. We worked with militia basically called the ASF, Afghan Security Forces. And they were basically just militia guys who didn't like the Taliban and wanted a better life and came and joined us. So we had a guy called Aziz who became the commander of all Afghan forces 10 years later when I was there again. Um, but, but back then he had like a dozen men, maybe 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 10 with him. So you're talking about six SF guys and maybe 10 Afghans rolling out in this convoy out to Shkin. We had uh, what's called... Um, Sade Special Operations something, something they're, they're signal intercept guys who can intercept uh, phone calls and push to talk radios in real time. And then you'd get chatter as you rolled out there. They'd come across the radio and say, hey, we, we just got chatter. And they said, the Americans are coming, get ready. And you'd see everybody reaching for their helmet and putting it on. Um, again, I made a lot of mistakes in my life. Rolling in a vehicle without full armor on is stupid. And you, you, you shouldn't do it, right? There's no excuse for not wearing your helmet and your body armor if you're in a vehicle. Um, if you're dismounted and maneuvering through the mountains, which I did later on, and you want to drop your helmet and run a plate carrier or just a chest rig, that's on you, right? And I did that because... I sacrifice security for maneuverability. However, in a vehicle, there's no excuse. But we did. I wore a baseball cap and uh, 
luckily it didn't it didn't bite me in the ass but as we, we rolled out there it took a lot of time but when we got there eventually we didn't get attacked on the road uh when we got there eventually there was i think two companies of infantry there um almost a battalion of infantry in that base so skin fire base was a big perimeter with with a, a kind of admin area in the middle and there was some oga there and there was some other elements at that base with us but we were kind of taking over the fire base from the infantry it was funny because they they rolled out they had like a hundred soldiers there or more and we rolled into it six guys and some indage so our our plan there and our mission was to and this is the classic special upper special forces green beret mission and i'm so glad i got to do it because it was it was so cool to be a part of that later on i was on direct action uh, going after high value targets, part of JSOC, the, the, and that was great too. But this here was so austere, and it was so make it up as you go along type thing. And it was such a classic SF mission that it was really cool. So we go out there, and we put out through our uh, our, our little militia commander as he's hey put out word to the local population and tell them that we are recruiting an army to go fight the Taliban. Come tomorrow for an interview and to be vetted. You can't really vet people. And bring your own AK-47 and two mags because we don't have any guns for you and or any ammo. So the next day, they'd come in. We'd kind of write their names down and stuff. And half of them would speak Pashto and half of them would speak Dari. And true interpreters and true, you know, pointy-talky language, we'd figure it out. And we'd get them in. And you can't really vet people, but we'd leave that to our indig commander as ease to, to kind of do that for us and he knew a lot of people and this was you know a couple of years before the first insider attacks really started happening um so we get them in we, we we didn't have any uniforms we didn't have any chest racks we didn't have anything for them but we got them with our guns and we started teaching them and training them in very very basic 7-8 maneuver right patrolling react to contact break contact react to indirect fire all these seven dash eight battle drills and we just run them and run them and run them and run them again and we we started identifying leaders within their ranks and then we would move those up that culture um it, it's very very you got to be delicate right and this is what the q course and robin sage was really really hammering that that cultural awareness when you're dealing with people <laughs> You know, American military yelling and screaming and uh, negative reinforcement is how we do things. That's not how you do things there. And it's not how you do things in the Middle East. It's all positive reinforcement. It's all high fives and you guys are great. And I'm going to eat with you. I'm going to uh, socialize with you and hang out with you and become part of the team. And that's what they teach in the Q Corps, in, in Robin Sage. Um, you don't look down on them. You don't talk crap to them. You kind of push this message one team one fight i remember sitting down with them of an evening and you know drinking tea and talking to them through a turp and one guy he told us that when when he was a boy the local taliban commander raped him and he bided his time and bided his time and when the invasion happened he joined the northern alliance and he was part of the unit who took back kandahar and he found that taliban commander and he raped him back which is like shocking, right? But this is the world they live in. <laughs> I was so shocked when he said that. I, I was like, oh my God. Um, but most of these guys wanted a better Afghanistan. They did not like the Taliban. They didn't, know how, they didn't like how they did things. But it there's a lot of things based in that culture that was a struggle for Americans to understand. Um. It was very difficult for Afghans to understand why they should pay tax, taxes to a central government in Kabul that was corrupt as hell when they did nothing for their village, absolutely nothing. They're up against this thing also where the Americans would roll in and they would bring soccer balls for the kids, give them medical attention, build a well. But as soon as they leave, the Taliban come in and chop off the village elder's head for talking to the Americans. You can't compete with that level of violence and that level of intimidation. Who would you side with? Um, 
again, Apocalypse Now, I remember in that movie, again, it was just fiction, but Colonel Kurtz kind of got it. Um, he, he was telling a story, if you remember, about when he was in a Green Beret in Vietnam before he went off the rails, but he was he said they went into a village and they vaccinated all the kids in the village against polio or something like that. And they left, and when they came back, the Viet Cong had chopped off all the arms of all the kids who got vaccinated. You can't compete with that level of intimidation. You just can't. So um, villages joined the Taliban, and they... they they dealt with the, the lesser of two evils and they, they went along with it, right? Um, and we really never had a chance of pacifying that whole country. It just wasn't going to happen. You're putting an American solution on a, a an Afghan problem or a Middle Eastern problem and it, the rest of the world doesn't work like America, okay? The West, rest of the world doesn't work like these, uh, these Western cultures. And it was... Uh, it was, we went in there for the right reasons and, and we, we sunk billions of dollars into that country and we lost thousands of, of uh, American lives, but it, it was, hopefully we learned our lesson because that, that, that country is, you know, the British learned it, the Russians learned it, they're in it for the long haul, they're in it for a long war, okay? So we go in and we, we start standing up this army and we started identifying leaders, doing battle drills and training and training and training. And when we got them to a very base level, we would hit what's called a, a confidence target. So we'd find a, a, a bad guy in a fairly easy to get to location and we'd go hit that target. And you're not getting in a huge gunfight, hopefully. You're, you're giving them a target that they can prosecute very, very easily to build their confidence, okay? At this point, we're also gathering all our own intelligence and building our own packets to um, hit targets, roll up bad guys, take their equipment, redistribute it to our Afghans, um, hit more tar- get the intel, hit more targets, get the intel, hit more targets, and we start building up. And an SF 12-man ODA can build up a battalion of indigenous forces, and that's a battalion of Americans that don't need boots on the ground. And that's the whole point. Build them up and teach them how to fight their own war, okay? Um... We had, it became much more difficult later on with the Afghan army because it was so corrupt and so many people were on the take. And it was the same with the Iraqi army later on. But um, with the with the ASF, it was Aziz. If a soldier went AWOL, Aziz would just go get him and roll his ass up and bring him back. And um, Aziz would get intel for us and we would go hit targets. And we hit a target and we found four RPD uh, Soviet machine guns. Older Soviet machine, awesome, awesome guns, but they shoot the same round as the, the AK-47, 762 by 39. But they were, they'd been sitting in water and they're completely seized and rusted. So myself and the other 18 Bravo, we worked on those things for days. We soaked them in diesel and oil, and then we beat the actions apart, and then we disassembled them and scrubbed them, and then reassembled them. Uh, zeroed them and painted them and they were awesome when we were done and that's what 18 Bravos do right that that's the core 18 Bravo mission and then we issued them to our indige um, we hit targets and found caches of uh, RPGs and we give them to our indige um, we end up buying uniforms desert uniforms and I have a picture on my Instagram but um, and we, we issued them to our indige and we built them up I have a picture of me teaching them the RPD as well and you're talking about guys who don't have a lot of training. They've been around guns, but they're super unsafe. So you're trying to drill that safety into them um, and, and kind of build their confidence. And then you go hit a target. And I'm not, we're not expecting perfection. Hit the target, shoot the bad guys. Don't shoot me. Anything else is a bonus. I'm not looking to train you to a high level because I'm probably going to have to come back and fight you at one point. So I'm training you to a base level. I'm getting you to a point where you can do this job yourself and I can go home. That's the whole point. And some people just didn't get that. Um, when I got there, there was a guy on that team who was leaving soon in a couple of weeks. And I straight off, you know, I always tell people, pay attention to, to the the vibe you get from people. I got a bad vibe from this guy. I actually made a, a, a CD to send my wife and it was like just basically me talking like this. And I said, I found it there a while ago, and I, it, I said on it, 
Um, I'm not going to send this home. There's a guy leaving next week. I'm not going to send it with him because I don't trust him. And I'll send it with another guy in a, in a couple of weeks, right? So this guy, I went back to uh, I'm back to Bagram with this guy. And we, we had a couple of funds in Afghanistan and Iraq. You had an operational fund. And that was for, like, I'm in a very austere base in the middle of nowhere. I'm going out on, on you know, long-range reconnaissance patrols for a week and living off the vehicle and all that. And they give you money, dollars, to build buildings, to grab, put gravel on roads, to build some sort of infrastructure in this very austere base. Now, the problem is that there's no accountability for that money. And sometimes you can get a receipt from a guy who may or may not even be able to write, all right? So it, it's sometimes you give that money to guys who are risk takers and they take a risk that way. So you had that and you had other funds that bought you food and stuff like that, fresh food. And But I was sent back to Bagram with this other guy to draw this uh, class one fund. And he was drawing the op fund. And he said to me, hey, there's no point in you coming back to clear this fund every month. I'll just draw both of them. And I was like, okay, sounds good to me. I went back, the team sergeant was like, damn, I didn't want that. I don't trust this guy. I wanted you to do I'm like, you didn't tell me that. Um, excuse me. So basically, <laughs> I remember we were back in Bagram and we were going through the, 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 the company and we met with the supply sergeant and he got, because he was the 18th Charlie, right? He was responsible for all our gear. He got a bunch of gear off the, uh, off the supply sergeant and he signed a hand receipt and I watched him and he signed the wrong name. I was like, oh, God. So anyway, this guy left Afghanistan and flew back and got stopped in the States with a large sum of money in his bag that he'd stolen from the team and was trying to bring back uh, a complete dirt bag. And I remember saying to the, to, to the um, team son, hey, you better check, because he left two tough boxes in with the team that were coming back on us in the, in the, in the, the pallet or the ISU-90. And I said, hey, you better check that. God knows what's in that. And, and Team Sergeant was like, no, it's fine. And then he came back like 30 minutes later, like, you know what? You're right. Let's check it. And there was all kinds of gear in there that he stole off other people. Um, so this guy gets prosecuted and he goes to court. They pull his tab. And in court, the officer on the team said that he sent them back with that money to buy cold weather gear for the indige, which is a lie, which means the officer was in on it. And people wonder why I don't like officers. Um, I, when I was the warrior leader course, first sergeant years later, I, I bring this up and I tell this story because you got a lot of young non-commissioned officers going to teams that have op funds. And I always tell them, look, if you're told to buy something you're not allowed to buy, just understand that when the music stops, you will be the one with no chair and you will get hammered and everybody else will walk away from you. And I, I saw that happen. So this guy gets prosecuted. He gets off with it, basically. Um, he goes back to his home state. I'm not going to say his name. He's just going to make it. He goes back to his home state, and he's like a war hero with, with 10 deployments where he only had two. And they buy him a house, and he just takes a whole advantage of this disabled war veteran BS. So I would say, please, please, please vet people properly. Um, this guy's a dirtbag. Um, now, I, I will say the team knew nothing about the theft of that money. They sent in an investigator who interviewed us all, and he interviewed me, and I'm like, look, I don't even know what the up fund's for. I just got here a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it, it kind of, it all fell on him. And they tried to prosecute him, but I, I'm not sure what happened, but I don't think they got, they got him prosecuted properly. The... Um, so as we build up this army, uh, another team came in um, and, and kind of shared the base with us. And there, there were another team from 2nd Battalion. And we didn't know. I knew one guy who was on the Q course with. And, and we kind of got to know him a little bit. We were very segregated. And we were doing most of the hits and the training. They had the Afghan army. We had this indigenous force that we were working with. So... They start, they got intel one day that there is foreign fighters out at this location and they spin up the whole Afghan army and they make this massive convoy and they're rolling out there. My team sergeant actually stopped them on the way out and he asked where you're going and they showed him and um, he said, that's a really dangerous place. The Ranger Regiment were ambushed there. Be careful. And they're like, yeah, we got it. And they roll out there and sure as hell they roll into an ambush 
and it was in a bowl and they got fired on from three locations from the side at ground level, from the front, from elevated shooting down and from the rear elevated shooting down into this bowl. And as they rolled in there, because I rolled out as the, as the quick reaction force, there was a, a truck, a jingle truck, big fancy truck on the side of the I don't know if it was purpose, but everybody's attention was on that when the first RPG came in and hit the vehicle side on. And the vehicle had no doors and the passenger in the front vehicle, which is an SF guy, um, took the brunt of that RPG and took his leg and his arm off and he died in a helicopter later on. The gunner was the guy I knew who returned fire on the 50 cal, stayed in position and just hammered the whole hillside. Um, the, the convoy got caught in the kill zone and all the Afghans got out shooting in all directions and another American got shot in the back of the head in that ambush. So two Americans are dead and we get we roll out there as a quick reaction force. We had a battery of 105s with us, artillery. We brought them with us. We set them up in and off and we hammered the mountains behind the ambush trying to cut off the retreat because they're trying to get back to uh, Pakistan. Um, as we roll in there, um, we pursue them up across the mountain. Um, I came across one Taliban guy who'd obviously been killed by the black blast of one of their own RPGs. He was obviously standing behind the RPG when it was fired. Um, as we pursued them across the mountain, what they do is if they can't make it to Pakistan, they'll just go into a village, they'll hide their weapons, they'll pick up farming tools and they'll start farming. Now we roll in, we find all military age maids, males, we flex cuff them, we gunshot residue test their hands and they come up positive for firing weapons, then what do you do? You can't roll everybody up. Um, you only have so much room on the truck. So you take advantage of that shock and awe and adrenaline and you do a tactical interrogation on them um, where you try to get something from them right there and then. And that that's the part that people don't understand. War is ugly and war will bring out some primal stuff in people. And um, I never thought I'd be the person who would punch a prisoner, right, uh, to get information. However, um, until you're ambushed and you lose friends and you maneuver across the, 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 the battlefield and you roll people up who you know did it and you have nothing on them, um, you're, you're trying to get that information before you process them. Now, we can roll them all up and process them and bring them back and put them in the system. They'll be out. They'll be out very, very quickly. You can't hold everybody, right? When we rolled prisoners up, we had to bring them back. We had like something like 24 hours to put them on a helicopter and send them back to Bargram. When they're back in Bargram, they go into the system and they'll be out. We, so we fought guys on the battlefield multiple times that were in a revolving door. Um, and that's that civilized way of fighting a war that, you know, they didn't have those rules. And, and um, it, it brings up the discussion of total war, right? Like Sherman is a vilified character in the South because he cut a swath right through the South in the Civil War. And his theory was you burn every crop, you kill all the livestock, you burn every building, and you give the enemy nothing to... Uh, no resources, and you make it hurt on the population that supports the enemy, right? Um, now, in a weird way, it's more humane because it makes the war, it, it, it brings an end to the war quicker um, than dragging it on for years and years and years. And by the time Sherman did that, the Civil War was, was dragging on for, for a couple of years. So this concept of total war, you bring everything to bear and you try to make it you try to bring it to an end as fast as possible and make that more humane. There's an argument for that. If you're going to come in and half-ass it for decades in some cases, you're dragging it out and dragging it out and dragging it out. Otherwise, if you're not willing to get in there and get your hands dirty, you probably shouldn't go, right? Um, the, there's a book called Devil's Guard, and it was... There, there's a lot of theories whether it's fiction or whether it's partly true or totally true, but it's about a guy who runs into a basically World War II Nazi in uh, Indochina somewhere in, in Vietnam. So uh, basically the, the, the book documents these 
German units that were rolled up and, and, and imprisoned after World War II in France. And instead of just letting them rot in prison, they put them in uniform and sent them over in the French Foreign Legion to Indochina to fight the Viet Minh early on in the 50s, before Dien Bien Phu, obviously. And these guys go in and wholesale slaughter the enemy. Like, and I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying that that book on unconventional warfare and counterinsurgency is kind of where you need to be or don't go at all. And if you're not committed to doing what has to be done, then you shouldn't be going to war and, and putting people into a meat grinder. The rules of engagement in Afghanistan when I was there early on were actually quite good. As the Obama administration came in, they got really, really strict. It got to a point where you could not return fire if you were fired at from a structure because there might be civilians in that structure, right? To me, the enemy chose to use that structure. That's on them, but you couldn't. So the enemy would start ambushing and shooting on American troops from these derelict buildings that nobody lived on, and nobody could. you couldn't even return small arms, never mind drop a bomb on them. Um, so trying to fight a war like that with one hand tied behind your back is ridiculous. Now, the, the ROE, the rule of engagement in Afghanistan, were very, very good, and then they got really, really bad and restrictive, and then they kind of settled out later on into something fairly reasonable. And we, we perfected later on, we perfected the drone strike in, in, in Afghanistan, but there's, there's, I'll get to that later on, but there's a lot of arguments as to whether shooting a hundred thousand dollar missile at a guy in a motorcycle is a good use of taxpayers money um so early on it became very ob obvious that fighting fighting a counterinsurgency war it is difficult right especially when the enemy can jump back across the border and you can't uh, get to them we got rocketed from pakistan all the time and we could not return fire. We had a, a FLIR system on a massive pole. We had a day camera and a night camera, uh, a thermal camera, and we could see for miles in all directions, and I could shoot a laser from the operations center that would give me a 10-digit grid of where the laser was shooting, where the crosshairs were, so, so I could drop super accurate artillery, catch you into Pakistan, right? Um, so it became very, very difficult our as we built up our base in, in skin firebase we uh we sent our indage our asf and they're all civilian clothes they went across the border into pakistan to buy stuff fairly regularly which in hindsight building up a pattern right they they were going across the border one time and our signal intercept guys could pick up chatter and it was a countdown five four three two one and it was from the pakistani army and it was a countdown to detonate an IED, which shredded a couple of our vehicles. It killed a couple of guys. We rolled out there. We, we medevaced them. The second in command of our ASF force was hit pretty hard. Our medics went to work on him and saved his life. But in hindsight, they would have been better off to let him die because he came back like three months later looking for money. And he was missing an eye, missing an arm, and missing a leg. And he was in bad shape. And that's not the country to be disabled like that. Um, and there was no mechanism to pay this guy. It just wasn't there. Um, we, we didn't have the money. We, we couldn't pay him. So it, it was pretty sad to see. The um, So as we built up this army and hit targets and hit targets and hit targets, uh, the rockets started getting more and more accurate. And once we left, there was the other team that was on the base with us. Um, one of those guys came back four months later to do a pre-deployment site survey for their next rotation. And as the helicopter landed, he was getting off. Rockets came in and hit the helicopter. And I think they, they injured him or they might have killed him. But um, that's how quickly it evolved. Because the team that took over from us did not push out and clear the white space around the base. They kind of hunkered down. And generally things get quiet in the winter. But they, they let the enemy they give them free movement to set up better launch sites. And that's why the, the, the launch points were more accurate. Um, I learned a lot on that, even though I was very experienced when I started. But I learned a lot about setting up firebase operations, um, setting up sectors of fire, you know, spacing on ammunition dumps throughout the camp so one rocket doesn't take out the whole freaking ammo dump. Um, 
uh, base defense plan. I wrote the base defense plan for that. Um, in hindsight, I should have rehearsed it and rehearsed it and rehearsed it. Um, there was a, a, a dry riverbed that ran all the way to Pakistan, right up to our fence, basically. Um, luckily, we had um, some early warning stuff out there, but that was always a concern to me. And then we had infiltrators inside gathering intelligence. I was up on the roof one day with a sniper rifle, a pair of binos, because every time we'd leave, that we'd pick, pick up chatter that would say, the Americans are leaving, three vehicles, right? The Americans are leaving this and that. Um, so they had intel watching everything we did. So I was up on the roof one time with a sniper rifle trying to find this guy. And uh, they came down and said, there's chatter. Uh, they said, the Americans have snipers watching for us. And it was, I couldn't spot that guy. Um, absolutely fantastic trip. One of the best trips I ever did, but very, very austere. We'd go out on these long-range patrols, be gone for days, be sleeping on the trucks, we'd be very vulnerable. We'd roll into these very remote villages who thought we were Russians. And sometimes they thought they were in Pakistan. They didn't even know what country they were in. Very channelized, driving on riverbeds, uh, hoping you don't hit an IED. We drove into a village one time and I was driving the lead vehicle and we pulled in and we were talking to the village elder and he said, oh, did you guys see the, the bomb on the road out there? And we're like, that road that we just drove in? And we went back and it turns out there was something like nine artillery shells buried under the road that we drove right over the top. And the firing device was in uh, low ground and it had rained the night before and the firing device got wet and it misfired and we would have been blown to pieces. Um, we called the OD, Explosive Ordnance, from the Army, and they came in, and the guy was screwing around, screwing around, screwing around, and it was taking forever. And Aziz, our commander, just got impatient, and he grabbed the dead cord, walked down there, tied it into the line, and blew the charge. Um, he was like, this is, this is ridiculous. The, and that, this, that was Aziz's personality. We sent him out one time. He, uh, we got intel that there was a weapons cache at a certain point, and they kind of showed us on the map, but in order to send up the con up, um, like the five W's up the headquarters to tell them what we're doing, they, we needed a grid. So our team sergeant sent Aziz out with a GPS, said, just go near and get a 10 digit grid and come back. Don't touch it, don't do anything, could be booby trapped. And Aziz rolled out there with a pickup truck, him and one other guy, and he came back with all the stuff in the back of the truck. He was like, I just picked it all up while I was there. <laughs> and uh, this is what he did. Um, another time we were driving, and an IED went off between two of our vehicles because the, the, it was uh, command detonated and it, they timed it wrong. Um, so uh, the great trip, very, very educational and, and great to be able to um, do that very austere, very traditional special forces mission. Um, 52. When we came back, we got relieved by the other two other teams and we drove all the way back. Um, when, when that team lost two people, they stood them down. I never really liked when people would stand down a team because they lost some guys. I think it's bad. I think you get back on the horse and you get back out there and you fight the enemy and you, you, you go get some payback. But um, they stood them down for a little bit. We took up, up their operations. We did a lot of hits. Um, and we really were making a difference in that area. Um, once we left, we drove all the way back um, through Kabul, all the way back to, to Bargram, laid out all our stuff, got it searched by the military police, and then we flew back. We stopped in Germany for, for a couple hours, and I'll finish this up on, on a funny story. We stopped in Germany, and... We all went, we're on a, on a Ramstein, a Rhein-Main Air Force Base, and we're, we're, we're there for like six or eight hours waiting to get on a plane back home. And we want to go home, obviously. Well, we all go to this mess hall, and everybody starts drinking except me. And everybody gets hammered except me. And uh, there's young soldiers there, and a fight starts over stupid stuff. I don't know why. And the MPs come, the Air Force, SF, or whatever they call them in the, in the Air Force. They come, and they are... I start talking to them, I'm like, look, you're dealing with soldiers here, been deployed for six months, no alcohol, not true, they had alcohol, but um, no alcohol and the low tolerance and we just want to go home. And my junior Bravo, um, 
he like took a swing at a guy. So they're going to arrest them. And I'm trying to talk them down and said, here's what we'll do. We'll bring him back and we'll breathalyze him. And we'll see. So we go back to the MP station and the breathalyzer's not working. So they're like, hey, we're just going to observe him for like 30 minutes. And if he doesn't act up or seem violent or belligerent, we let him go. And I'm like, sit your ass down there and don't make a sound because I'm going home tonight. We're not playing this game. And I go out and I'm talking to the MPs. I'm trying to build rapport. And I look back into the room they have him in, observing him. And, uh, you know, McGruff the dog, take a bite out of crime. They had a costume in there, probably for kids' things or something, right? And I look back into the room and he's got the head of McGruff the dog on. And he's just sitting there looking around. <laughs> and it was really funny. But at the time, I was like, take that off, you jackass. Um... Yeah, so we end up getting on the plane, and uh, I don't think he came out in the blot or for that, but we got home. Um, just lastly on awards, at the end of that trip, I got a Bronze Star, which is just a service award for a combat zone. Um, the other 18 Bravo on my team got an ARCOM, an Army Commendation, which is not the award you should be getting for combat and for actually living austere and fighting the enemy and getting in gunfights and getting shot at and getting blown up. An ARCOM is a slap in the face and it's purely tied to rank. He was a staff sergeant. I was a sergeant first class. He'd actually been in country longer than me because I got there. He was already there. Um, i give you an example, right? The awards go AAM, Army Achievement Medal, which is like, a, a hey, great job. Uh, you got to work on time for a week. There's an AAM, right? Then the ARCOM is a little higher award, but it's it sounds like it's really not much of an award. I'll give you an example. When I went to basic infantry, BNOC, which is E6 leadership school, I went to Fort Benning. There was a guy there who told me that he got an ARCOM one time because he moved the turtle off the road at the National Training Center. And it was an endangered turtle, sort of give him an ARCOM. So you get an ARCOM for moving a turtle off the road, and then you get an ARCOM for six months in combat and getting shot at and blown up and, and living in austere conditions. So it was a slap in the face, and it was purely tied to rank, which happens a lot. And I'll talk about awards later on. It's a very, very abused system. And I'm not saying people don't deserve the awards they get. I just say that it's super abused, and a lot of people get awards that they... They, you know, the write-up is super embellished and they get awards for stuff that other people did. Um, and it's one of my pet peeves. So, um, all right, that's unconventional warfare. Obviously, there's a whole lot more meat in that kind of six months thing, but I just didn't want to go down too much detail. Um, I'll, I'll come back to it again. If you have questions, you can hit me up. Um, and uh, yeah, that I think is about it. Quick plug for Fieldcraft Training. Check out fieldcraftsurvival.com. See if there's training near you. Please come train with us. And it's how we keep the lights on. Okay, till next time. Thanks, bye.